eight hours ago, I was sitting down having dinner and my wife had tears in her eyes. I'm like, well, what's going on? And she said, I met this amazing woman and I went to her place and she has this entire facility where men, even, even uh, guys my age, are coming back from, from war and they don't have a place to live or stay. And she's, in, she's in create, created this entire um, this facility in this nonprofit organization that's helping these guys literally uh, might maybe get off drugs, rehabilitate, get back into the world. And the things that my wife told me, you know, I'll save it for this, but it, it made me cry at the table. And I'm like, we got to get this lady on the podcast. And what you're doing is amazing. Thank you. And I, I want to learn more about this. So what do you do? And, and how did you get into this? There is a little bit of a backstory. So, um, Seven years ago, I found this building that was empty. It was had it been in foreclosure. It's a, a an old Red Cross building. It's eleven thousand square feet, and I bought it. And I started a a five hundred one c three nonprofit. Um, I knew I wanted to do something for the homeless. Um, reason being is that I was homeless at one point in my life. Mm-hmm. It was um, decades ago. I was fourteen. But it's still something that stays with you, you know. So um, I, I just researched, uh, I, I Googled literally homeless in Metro Detroit. And I wanted to educate myself on what was happening in the homeless arena in our, you know, in, in, in my area. And so obviously this is, these are, these are our neighbors, our friends that have found crisis that are sleeping in their cars or whatever. But in my research, that's when I found about the plight of the veterans. And I know as a civilian, we all hear, you know, our veterans need your support. And, you know, I was one of those people. I didn't know what to do. Okay. And they, yeah, what, what can we do? I was the one that would buy their coffee at Starbucks or, you know, see families, veteran fam or the military families from Selfridge out at a restaurant for dinner, I would, you know, pick up their dinner tab or something. Because we don't, we don't know what to do. We don't know what they need. We don't know why or how they're broken. And we don't know how to help them. So when I, when I decided to start this, this uh, mission of uh, my nonprofit, I knew once I learned about the plight of the veterans, I knew that that was the direction I was going to go. Um, I mean, if we can't, help our veterans who have sacrificed and done so much for us, Mm -hmm. you know, that that there's, there's just something that I knew just, I couldn't ignore after I, you know, educated myself on the issues that they're having. So I was very fortunate to be in a position. I started um, my company, my for-profit company in 1999. It's called Empire Pays and um, we're a credit card processing company. And, um, and we are very successful. I don't, I don't want to paint a picture like I'm major wealthy. I'm not, I'm, but I'm more than comfortable. So I've, I, I say I've made more than my fair share of nickels and it was time for me to, to, to give back. I, I felt compelled to do something more fulfilling in with the rest of my life. So I turned my company over to my staff and, um, bought that Red Cross building, and started Vets Returning Home. That was seven years ago, and we've housed over 1,700 veterans at our facility. We have 43 beds. The veterans live on site, full commercial kitchen and career closet and um, resource center, a theater room. Um, so they have all, we, we cover all their basic needs. You know, so they, they live right there. And we first what we do is identify the issues that brought them to crisis. And um, a lot of times, you know, people are like, they don't, we as civilians don't understand why they're so broken. It's um, when I first started, there were over a million disability claims backlogged two years. So if you can imagine going overseas, serving our country, going to war, getting blown up, you come home and it's going to take you two years before you're going to get your disability income. So, I mean, common sense will say if you're disabled and you can't work, but it's two years before you get your disability income, obviously it's going to create a crisis in your life and most likely homeless. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. Thank you. 
I, I can honestly say it is, um, I, I, I want to say my pleasure. Um, it's not fun in that way, but it is my honor. It's my honor. Mm-hmm. That's a better way to put it. It's my honor to do what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, the story my wife told me when we were out to eat was uh, she said that a, a guy came into like the office. Uh, you guys were filming a video or helping to get the word out, and which you've already done in a massive way, but even more so. And the guy was about maybe maybe my age, and he was a a veteran, and he asked you a question, but his voice was very meek and humble as though he had lost all his confidence and self-esteem of the thing that makes a man a masculine man. And he was like, right. he put his head down when he was asking you a question and you responded him to him as a place of like, from a place of unconditional love. Like, and he looked at you and he held you in a place of like, there's a safety, this security. Right. And, um, that's what made me cry because I know what it feels like to kind of be in that, that position somewhat because I've been homeless and I've been through things. Now, I haven't been to war, but I do have a, a good friend. That one of my best friends committed suicide after he came back from Iraq, and it was, uh, it was yeah. very hard. And when she told me that, I could feel what it's like to be in that man's shoes for a second because it's really hard to go out there and hustle and get your life back on track when you have been just like almost – I don't know what the word is, but kind of had everything ripped away from you. Yeah. And so that's amazing that you're, you're doing that. How are you, I mean, how are you funding this? I have yet to see this, the place, but I would like to go. Yeah, you're, actually, I would like to invite, and I, and I extend this invitation freely. Please, if you're in the neighborhood of 11 and Gratiot in Roseville, Michigan, stop in. You don't need an appointment. Pay your respects to these veterans. Let them know that you appreciate their, their service and what they've done for this country. Um, they feel like they are forgotten, you know. Um, a lot of them will say to me, you know, I I can't believe that, you know, nobody cares. I went over, you know, to Afghanistan. I did two combat tours. I got blown up. You know, I come home. They, they You know, the government used me up and then discarded me and, you know, n- and nobody cares. And I, and I tell my veterans, though, you should see if you have a chance to, to stop in around the holidays between Veterans Day and Christmas, the community always comes through and those guys get so much attention. The problem is, is that they're forgotten the rest of the year, you know, and, and I don't mean that literally because I have a lot of support through, um, you know, the VFW and the AMVETS and American Legion. And, um, you know, they help me whenever I need help. <clears throat> and churches and the UAW, the some of the locals and the, you know, so, and, and I have some corporate sponsors as well. So that's how we're funded. It is a community effort. Um, and, uh, you know, I have to, I hate to steal Oprah Winfrey's line, but it takes a village. Um, you know, when I first opened Vets Are Turning Home, I used my entire retirement account. I didn't. I didn't plan it that way. It just kind of evolved to that. But um, I have to tell this one quick little story that kind of puts in perspective a little bit of what happens there. But I purchased that building August first of two thousand thirteen. That's actually the day I closed on the building. On August third, I got my first veteran that walked through the door. And he said, I, I understand that you're helping veterans. And, and I asked him, I, are you in a housing crisis or, you know, what's going on? And he had been sleeping on the bench outside of Checkers Fast Food for three weeks. So I said to him, well, I mean, I just, I don't even know how to turn the lights on. You know, I, I just closed on this building. So I don't even know what, what I have here yet. But the utilities are on. The You know, you can flush the toilets. You can take a hot shower. I didn't have much to offer, but I told him, you can, you know, roll up on a sleeping bag. I'll give you a sleeping bag. You're, at least you're safe and warm and, you know, it's clean. And uh, and I said to him, if anybody asks, though, you tell them you're my night watchman because I don't have an occupancy permit. So that's kind of the cool part of the story. It tells two things. One, since August 3rd of 2013, my life has been a blur ever since that day. Um, they just keep coming. and And two... Um, it kind of describes really what I lend to this program is I'm an out-of-the-box, 
problem solver, and I don't take no for an answer. So failure is not an option. And so that's what I do for the veterans. Um, we When they first come in, we identify those issues that brought them to crisis. And a lot of it is, you know, what I've uh, observed, we'll say, in meeting with so many veterans. You know, these guys, they, they were, up until they were 18 years old, they were at home with their mom, and their mom said, get up, get dressed, make your bed. You know, uh, dinner's at 6, you better be home by 11. And then they went in the military. And Uncle Sam told them right down to the color socks they were going to wear. And after their time of service, they are, they're done with them. They send them home. And these guys have said to me, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Nobody's telling me what to do. You know, they're grown men now, so mom's not, mom's not going to tell you what to do anymore. But yet they never learned those problem-solving skills that, you know, civilians learn. Those kids, civilian kids learn it when they go to college. They learn, you know, don't take the, you know, stipend your parents gave you to last year of the month and blow it on a beer and pizza party on Friday night or you're going to be hungry the rest of the month. Whereas in the military, they don't have to deal with that because they always had the three hots and a cot, they call it. But now that they're home, they never developed those, you know, the same kind of uh, experiences that we did as civilians, learning things the hard way. They come home and now they're expected to know this because they're grown men, but they don't. And so when they get in, they get a situation where there is a problem, um, for example, you know, uh, working a lot of overtime, they cut the overtime and then they couldn't pay their car insurance. So he, uh, couldn't renew the plates on his car, and then he got a ticket for driving an expired plate, and he didn't pay the ticket, and then he went, to, the next time he, had, he got pulled over, there was a bench warrant, you go to jail. When you're in jail, you lose your job, and while you're in jail, they impound your car, and then when you get out, you can't pay your rent because you lost your job, and the next thing you know, you're homeless. So these guys have a, 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 almost layers of issues they didn't make one wrong turn and end up at vets or turning home. You know, it's things just kind of piled up. The fact that, you know, their disability claims were backlogged two years didn't, didn't help. Those, by the way, have been caught up in recent years. Um, so that is no longer the issue with the, the, the back claims. They still have to fight like hell to get their claims. And a lot of these veterans don't even want to fight for it. They're, they they feel like... Um, they don't want to deal with the with the government. They don't want to deal with the VA. And then they feel like they're asking for a handout or something. And I always tell them, listen, it's like if somebody T-boned you in your car, would you call your insurance agent and make your claim? Well, yeah, of course I would. Okay, then make your claim for your disability. You serve this country. This is a benefit that you've earned. It's not a handout. You know, it's the least we can do. And the, the average disability claim, for our, our veterans, is $1,200 a month. So that's, you know, that's what they aspire to get is 1200 bucks, And now they're disabled for the rest of their lives. So it's pretty sad. Yeah. That was a lot. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah. You, you talk about it in a way that is the perfect balance of a mission, a mission based spiritual, emotional, and very logical and practical. Yes. So you you marry those two together, and so uh, how can how can I help? What can I do? What can anybody do? Well, I went through this. Uh, I had an epiphany. Yeah. During the beginning of this COVID crisis. In that, you know, prior to COVID, Vets Returning Home was doing phenomenally well. We we do we host two events a year, and I'm pretty good at fundraising. Mm. And uh, our events was scheduled for March 14th, and it was March 13th when Trump came out and said, you know, 15 days to slow the spread. So I had to cancel our fundraising event the day before. Um, you know, it was scheduled and I have not hosted any fundraising since. And, and we receive no government funding and that is by design. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy that kind of goes along with mm -hmm. the government funding. I, I'm an out of the box person 
if I took the government funding, all the solutions have to be in the box, and that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. So that's why our program is as successful in benefiting so many veterans is because we can react and respond quickly to their needs. Mm -hmm. and Instead of dealing with a whole bunch of red tape. Exactly. So during that COVID uh, lockdown in the early stages of this, my brain just went crazy like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? I mean, the last thing we can do is let this program fail and these homeless veterans be homeless again. You know what I mean? With nothing that at, at that point. So I did come up with a couple of different out-of-the-box solutions. I can't in good conscience go and ask small businesses to give me money. Um, our, business, our small businesses are in trouble right now because of this COVID situation here. And um, so I, I, I came up with two different programs that I think uh, uh, are truly win-wins. So with my credit card processing company, my company is, is, is still and has been doing fine. Um, I have an amazing staff. They've been with me since I started the company in 1999. And that's how I can afford to volunteer because I still get paid through my company. But um, so I, I found a solution of, okay, so what can, what can I do? What do I do? And um, it just made sense to me to go back doing what I am good at. And so I am back out now actively soliciting uh, businesses for their credit card processing. And um, my company will donate 100% of the profits to Vets Returning Home to build a residual income so that my, I keep saying, like, what if I get hit by a bus? Mm -hmm. You know, if I get hit by a bus, I'm like the, the, the energy, if you will, that, you know, mm -hmm. it, that brings everybody to these fundraising events that we used to host anyway. So a residual income would long survive, you know, the program would survive e even long after me. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm saying. So I, I thought that that was kind of a great idea. So if, I don't know if your followers, business owners, mm -hmm. you know, let me analyze your merchant account. And I know it's um, one of those things that nobody wants to deal with, you know, but I am, uh, I looked at it as not only can I help these small businesses by improving on their situations and giving them better pricing on their credit card processing, but then in turn, feed a homeless veteran while we're doing it, you know. So that's that's one program that I came up with, and uh, I really need help with that. Mm -hmm. It's it's a hard industry, um, you know. I I I pounded that pavement for twenty years, and you know, um, the only thing that would get me to go back to pounding that pavement is taking care of these veterans because they're 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 worth it. They deserve it, and you know, it's a perfect solution. And then we did come up with another program. We call it our supporting partner program. And um, what that is is basically businesses are still have to, they still have to spend money on marketing. And um, so I created this where if, if a business uh, makes a, a commitment to that's returning home, like a monthly mm -hmm. uh, commitment for, because I'm really trying to build that residual where, no matter what happens with fundraising dinners and large gatherings and stuff, we need to survive no matter what. So um, the different thresholds are like there's a, a package for $25 a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month. And in, in exchange, because it's got to be a win-win. So for the businesses that participate in our supporting partner program, I brought this plaque. Oh, that's cool. So you get this plaque that says we're a proud supporter of Vets Returning Home with our logo. And then um, they get a window cling, same, same image, window clings, proud supporter. Um, they get to put our logo on their website. And um, we, can put, we can put their logo on our website. We come out and do a live stream uh, featuring their business and encourage the community to help support, you know, their business because they're while they're supporting our veterans so you got um, a viral idea right there because I, it would get shared all over the place exactly and then we also have an ad they we put in their uh, uh, ad in our newsletter and you know so it, it I, I truly do think that it has a lot of reciprocal value you know mm. um 100 bucks a month 
There's a lot of businesses that can't afford that right now that are hanging on by their fingernails. And I totally get that. And um, so that's why the two different programs, I think, you know, if you can't afford 100 bucks or 25 or whatever, if you can't afford to, to participate in that program, then, you know, participate in the in the uh, credit card processing program because both of them are extremely powerful and beneficial to um, the businesses. Because if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm-hmm. I would be the first one to tell you if your merchant account is where it's supposed to be. But if I can, you know, cut 10 to 30% off the fees that you're paying and take those proceeds to help feed a homeless veteran, then, you know, it made total sense to me. What do you think? I think it's a great idea. I'm also very um, impressed. I don't mean to put the spotlight on you. It doesn't really expect a response, but how you've moved your life and calling into radical contribution. And when you have a purpose that drives you so hard or God's mandate in your life that nothing else matters and the way will just keep opening up and uh, I actually aspire to be where you've evolved to. Thank you. It's a beautiful place. I can uh, attest that I mean, I'm I'm 62 years old. I've been through, you know, lots of ups and downs in my life, and uh, I I could cite many cases where the more you give away, the more it comes back. And the Bible says, "You reap what you sow." And if you want a good garden, you sow the seed. So why do I give it away? I mean, I, you know, I. I I have a ninth grade education. I mean, I was homeless right after the ninth grade. Mm. And I had my son when I was 15. Didn't have time to go back to school. I couldn't get a decent job without an education. Um, so so when I was 15, I was uh, I got a job in a, at a factory work in midnight shift, and I used to have to hitchhike back and forth to work, which was very dangerous even back then. You know, So I did that for about a year, and then I became a roofer and a drywaller. And I did that until I was in my early 20s. And I kept, I could not get a job. So I thought, you know what? I have to figure out how to be a business owner. I have to just work for myself. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I started my first company. By the time I started my third company, which is Empire Pays, um, the light came on, like how to actually be a business owner, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and do it right with integrity. And I've built something I'm very proud of, um, in an industry that, that, um, doesn't have a very good reputation. Credit card processing is not. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of problems in that industry. Mm-hmm. But I'm very proud of my company. I'm very proud of the accomplishments that uh, uh, that and the contributions that we've made in the community in making a difference with small businesses, knowing that they're in good hands and we're taking good care of them, giving them the right pricing and service and those kinds of things. But um, this opportunity for me seven years ago. To be able to give back was, you know, part of part of my Christian walk, but um, I mean, a big part of my Christian walk. But I just felt like there's got to be more than just making money. You mm-hmm. know, I could I, I got to the point where it's just like I don't care to make any more money. I have everything that I need. I need to do something to make a difference now, a big difference. So, um, yeah, there came vets are turning home. Thank you. You make me, th- I don't really talk about this much uh, here on my social media. I'm not pushing my beliefs on anybody, but I have this uh, kind of a vision. It's like when you die and you pass on and you, you meet, say it's Jesus, and he plays your whole life before your eyes. And then this one moment comes up where you kind of turned a yeah. blind eye, and then that person fell off the edge of the cliff or those people, or you could have done something. Right. And then you can come up with all the excuses in that moment or bag or cry or say, make, you know, anything. And, um, but you can't go back and fix it because you were fully conscious and aware of what you were doing in the moment. And, and, uh, and I do also believe you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first and you have to make sure that you're stable and then you can go out and help others. Correct. Otherwise you'll just end up being swept along with the current over and over and over. And, uh, I've I've been there too, but any, anyways, um, there's something that was popping up in my mind. The definition of confidence is your belief in your own ability to figure things out. And you're talking about the structure that they had, and when you're thrown out into the world with no structure like that, 
um, you can lose your confidence very quickly if you've never even built it at all. And when I started my own small business, I came from working jobs and I was very frustrated. I was like, nobody is giving me a manual or a rule book of how to do this. And I had to reach inside of myself and figure things out. And I still am doing that every day. And that makes me relate to what you're saying. So can you, can you plug websites and stuff? And we're going to put all this in the show notes too below. You can also see this on the Untrapped Podcast uh, YouTube channel. Check all the video descriptions for the links that she's about to say. So where can we go? That's returninghome.org. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously that's our website. Then we have our, our Facebook and Instagram and all those things. Uh, if, um, my email address is, uh, um, Sandy, S A N D Y at vets returning Um, my phone number five, eight, six, two, one, six, eight, five, one, zero. And, um, I think that's, I don't know. I missed any. 